Hello. My name is Gurcharan Das and it is my privilege to moderate this discussion on Princess Sistan, How Nehru Patel and Mountbatten Made India by Sandeep Bamsai. So this is the book. And let me introduce you to our distinguished panel, beginning with the author, Sandeep Bamsai, who calls himself a news junkie, a rather colorful way to describe his profession as a journalist. He is presently editor-in-chief of the Newswire IANS. His earlier books were about the Bombay Cricket team, Bombay Cricket story, and another one on Kashmir called The Bonfire of Kashmiriyat, the story of Kashmir's accession. The second panelist is Rajan Harshe, the former vice chancellor of Central University, Allahabad, and a visiting professor of the South Asian University. The third panelist is Ashok Bhan, senior advocate at the Supreme Court of India. My job really was, is that of a schoolmaster today to make sure everybody behaves himself. I'll keep time, be the timekeeper. Make sure you all get a chance to ask a question that you want to and keep a conversation flowing and make it informal so that we are friends. Uh, we are friends who are conversing in our virtual drawing room. So, you know, the, this book is really, it's, India was born in 1947 in the shadows of Hitler, Stalin and Mao created by saints. Now it is dangerous to put saints in power. Fortunately, we had amongst us, amongst them, some persons not of great competence who knew how to manage power and who managed the peaceful integration of 565 princely states, which accounted for 40% of the subcontinent's territory and 20% of the subcontinent's population. Some of these states wanted to remain independent. And it's a great tribute to the diplomacy, the persuasiveness of these people to manage this integration and not allow the balkanization of India that Mr. Churchill had predicted. Today, it is hard to imagine Today, it's hard to imagine that India was potentially 500 plus states, countries, nations. And the threat of disintegration was very real. And, you know, we, we had seen the violence that came out of the partition of only one part or two parts of India. And imagine the horror of a second partition that would have created all these states. And thank God, Princess Sistan, which is what Sandeep calls it, was a stillborn child. So these men use divide and rule. They massage the egos of the rulers. They 
uh, brought some states early and some states they created unrest, unsettled them, they played childlike games, they played on the vanities of these rulers, their titles, all these things. It's a great story. And so I shall invite first Rajan Harshe to say a few words and then Sandeep you come in and and respond to Rajan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's really privileged to be part of this gathering. I should like to thank IISC for inviting me to speak on this area. I would also like to congratulate Sandeep Ji at the outset for writing such eminently readable book. It reads so well, full of anecdotes, full of uh, constitutional arrangements which you are going through, full of interesting details which attracted me like in a way princes were living their lives with opulence. I will raise certain kinds of questions which could be useful for discussion uh, that we are going to have. First point that I thought I should make was that when we are doing something like integrating 565 states of Pakistan's, one has to have idea about India. And my proposition is that idea of India was evolving with India's freedom struggle because of Gandhi, Nehru, perhaps even Ambedkar in some way. And constitution of India was evolving, idea was evolving too. And if you look at Jawaharlal Nehru, the discovery of India, it gives you a very succinct idea of what India can be. Unity in diversity. India full of diversities, but some thread binds it. Jawaharlal Nehru was trying to construct India on the geographical map of India, he was constructing it socially. So my first question to author is, was that idea, you also perceived it, because it's a clear idea that diversity is India's strength, different communities have lived together and coexisted and made this India, and that is how India can work, diversity is a fact, and we'll come to that later, but this is one important point that I wanted to make. The second point which Guru Charanji said was, you know, 100 million people, 565 states, and the uneven states, you have Baroda, Mysore, Kashmir, Hyderabad, Travancore, they were doing well. The so many smaller states of Deccan or many other parts had nothing, but they still wanted to be independent. The point then is, it was all negotiatory settlement which was settling it with the loss of paramounts in somewhere, or would be loss of paramounts. So British power, the kings, and they wanted to get the best. That was the tussle on, and how India tried to work through negotiations, how it tried to incorporate all these, is a question one has to understand, answer also. Out of these states, as Guru Charanji was pointing out, and you have put it so nicely, by negotiations, by bullying, sometimes by persuading, Patel was able to make it, Nehru was able to make it, but the two states remain problems. One was Hyderabad, the other was Kashmir. And I'll come to that later with some questions. I also was particularly struck by the way you have discussed different characters. And that was very alive in your book. I'll just briefly put my idea just to carry on the discussion. Very Jinnah, Muslim leader, he wanted two nation theory to, pro he wanted to promote two nation theory and eventually a geographically non-contiguous state emerged in the subcontinent. It thrived on anti-Indianism and it was based on religion. Somewhere, perhaps, you know, Jinnah was not a deeply religious man like Gandhi and Azad, but he surely was communal at one level when he made this country. At the same time, when he gave speech in Pakistan, it doesn't immediately after independence, it doesn't sound like a communal man's speech. This is one question that always bothers me. Second actor, this was Gandhiji. And we have brought out very rightly on Saurashtra and Kathiawad and Gandhi's areas particularly. But Gandhi really tried to integrate those from the 30s in Indian Union. Do you think that these were all my experiments with truth, the part of extended my experiment with truth because Gandhi went on fast, withdrew, regretted the fast, and you have described it so wonderfully. You have also described Patel's character. Patel was down to earth. Patel was administrator. Patel had a capacity to negotiate in a very tough way with everybody. Patel knew 
each prince and their their weaknesses and he was never willing to withdraw one seat to proposition you have nehru one very interesting man fabian socialist he believed in protest he believed in democracy he believed in republican world and not world of princes and that's how india became also republic in some way that fabian socialism is of his was an influential in some way that's why your protest all over nehru participates in the protest he had gone once in nava jail but farida court kashmir he arrested himself that means popular protest to kind of talk about him today he was perhaps like a human rights activist that he wanted self determination and people support his sort and you have brought it out so well to kachru to many kind of references that you have made i think these personalities come out very alive and last but not the least mount batten too that somebody is being sent to liquidate the empire appeals to my mind and mount batten played his role in his own way he played between all the contending parties to steer the course of uh, india's integration or whatever it was a division of uh, subcontinent and that also has come out well i would make two last points because i am aware of the time limit one is you know that whenever you think of state and nation to my mind both are violent enterprises and i would like your reaction state obviously is violent because it has legitimate or illegitimate physical force apart from territory sovereignty and government it has also extractive power state is juridical so it is violent but building a nation also is a violent phenomena it showed it through partition consistently this violence goes on because you start excluding others somewhere and build a nation i think this problem we are facing in all along in the world like the nationality is trying to become states and that's how sri lankan tamilians began to feel that their nationality they want to be state or kurdish people in west asia they want to be a state through by breaking away from iraq or the turkey or you have bas separatists in spain you have large number of secessionist movements in africa so you know, this is a problem where nationalities are in search of states and there's a state trying to become nations how does one characterize india actually and if you look at india is it a nation in the making is it a multinational state where many nationalities bengali marathi and tamilians are together under one political state or is it civilizational state how does one make sense out of this india and another point that i would like to make which is aligned to this point is that while integrating it for example kashmir i don't know whether we made mess but the maharaja hari singh was made to sign the instrument of accession at least two third was taken over by india kashmir is a gateway to central asia south asia and west asia it is also gateway to transit uh, traffic between arms and arms trade or drug trade goes through kashmir terrorism goes through kashmir and this has become a problem it will come up in our discussion later and hyderabad i would like to say you have described very nicely menon's words police action but i know for sure that it was a military action and 108 hours indian troops actually worked in hyderabad to liberate it completely now again the question once again arises that the diversity of india and how india will survive in the days ahead that is a question i all the time feel worried about the constitution defines india as a union of states and all these princes princely states also came with some measure of you know they wanted something and they wanted to give away something we are carried on as linguistic states we are union of states and how does next set of problems will arise and particularly hyderabad may have been integrated but kashmir kind of raises several questions which i am sure other speakers will speak about and i also like the different constitutional arrangements the role of chambers of princes and many other things which you kept on discussing so i would say at the outset and my preliminary remark congratulations and i am very happy to have read this book thank you very much i thank you tandeep uh, what i would like to do is before you ask answer rajin's questions please tell us please tell the listeners the viewers of this uh, give us a little bit about the book and what you have been doing and and so on give us a little background how you got into it but what is your what's your mission in the book so uh, the story goes back to my grandfather actually who served as osd to pandit ji uh, 
even before Panditji became Prime Minister and then carried on uh, till 1964 till Panditji passed away and then went on to become OSD to Lal Bahadur Shastri and Mrs. Gandhi. Uh, but given that we are looking at uh, the pre and post partition part of history, uh, he along with another Kashmiri called Dwarkanath Kachru, who was Nehru Panditji's uh, personal assistant. These were the two young Kashmiri that uh, Nehru, uh, Pandit Nehru brought on board. In fact, in I fact, believe, I believe that your grandfather was such an admirer of Panditji that he gave your father's name, uh, your, his son, your father's was called That's Jawahar Lal. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So he was uh, like many Kashmiris and many Indians at that particular point in time, completely besotted with the idea of Jawaharlal Nehru. So his first child, he actually named him Jawaharlal after Jawaharlal Nehru. And while there are many people who are called Jawahar, in my father's case, it was Jawaharlal, so which makes it completely, completely Nehruvian uh, to, to the last uh, detail, as it were. And uh, I think... Uh, in, in all, I was, I was in many ways my grandfather's favorite, but my grandfather never, ever discussed politics or what he did uh, with anybody, particularly the, the, his grandchildren. Whatever little anecdotal history I have came from my father, who obviously was, uh, as a child and as growing up, he saw many, uh, much of this. But uh, my grandfather left a treasure trove of... Uh, well, notes, documents, missives, uh, aid memoirs, but no, no personal notes. And he he bequeathed this whole thing to me uh, since I was a journalist, and he thought that I would do something with it. And uh, when it came, when I got the time finally, I, I was the national business editor of Hindustan Times uh, between 2000 and 2006. And when I left, I decided that this is the moment that I should take a brief sabbatical and write the book. Mr. Mehra of Rupa was very kind. He realized uh, the importance of the papers that I had. And I, uh, I wrote the first of what I thought would be a trilogy. Uh, the one, the book that you referred to, which is uh, Bonfire of Kashmiriyat, the story of Kashmir's controversial accession to India. And then I wanted, when I was, when I was going through these papers and documents, etc., I discovered that there was another strand of another strand, another narrative that could emerge from these papers because these are these are two huge trunks with, with all these papers which were left for me and they've been maintained, I must add, by my mother very carefully. And you'll be surprised that 70 years later there is no silverfish. Those papers and documents are more or less in pristine condition thanks to my mother. But uh, to come back to the book, when I, when I finished this book, I realized that maybe I'd left something uh, unfinished and and this story of the princes which I continued to read while I was writing the first part of this trilogy it it uh, it got some sort of a hold on me and I and I told myself that I think this story is greater this story needs to be told and this story must be told so again as a professional journalist it is impossible to but focus was on was there writing a book. was there any trigger Sandeep that turned you to the princely states because we sort of have forgotten how that India was really states and that's how India has been. India is not it's a, a it's a very it's a very not good a question, Mr. Das. Empires. Absolutely it's a very good question, Mr. Das. I'll tell you what the trigger was. This happened in about 2015, which is nine years after I wrote the first part. And uh, uh, there was a revision, a vile revision of Nehru, which was taking place in, in 2015, 2016, 2017. And I, uh, when I, when I read these papers, I realized and I and I told myself that uh, Jawaharlal Nehru was an equal participant and probably the progenitor of roping in the states, of quarreling the states. From the information in the papers, I realized that this this was a fact and this needed to be presented to the world as it were. And I was actually quite surprised that after having read Nehru's, Nehruji's own biographers like Frank Murez or even Sarvapalli Gopal, 
this strand of information or narrative did not emerge from any of those uh, treaties. None of those tomes yeah. have this yeah. strand so of I'll, I'll just tell the, the, Let me just tell the uh, Sandeep one second. Let me tell the viewers that actually the story that has been told, especially it was VP Menon's book that we all read. And the story that was told is, a, is the impression that it left behind that it was really Sadar Patel and VP Menon who did all this. And the role of Nehru and Mountbatten has not been appreciated as much. And I think that's what you're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that is that is what emerges from these documents and uh, missives and aid memoirs. That it is Nehru as a Fabian socialist who grew up in, in Britain and who was influenced by George Bernard Shaw uh, in, in Britain. And then subsequently, one of his gurus was Annie Besant. And he, he had this completely anti-monarchial view. And this anti-monarchial view does not emerge. Okay, there are there are there are speeches etc which seem to suggest that he's anti-monarchial but the what professor what professor harshay rightly said the the maltreatment in naba uh, his incarceration which was absolutely brutal and it, it is his father who actually uh, brings him back from naba by giving some sort of an apology to the raja of naba and then subsequently, Farid Court and the experience again in Kashmir and Domel, where once again he was incarcerated, and one of the Ra Maharaja's guards actually tried to uh, use uh, the butt of his rifle to attack him. And both Dwarkanath Katru and my grandfather K. N. Bamzai were with Jawaharlal Nehru at that particular point. And both of them actually saved him from that guard's uh, attack in Domel. But the bottom line here is that I. I think we have not been fair to Jawaharlal Nehru and Mountbatten because this story of amalgamation, this story of roping in and quarreling the princes would be completely in, incomplete without the role of Nehru and Mountbatten. And that's why yeah. I've, I've gone sequentially in this book and said that how Nehru, Patel and Mountbatten made India. Now, let's understand. We, we are in the throes of partition. There is while bloodshedding, bloodletting all over. And we are simultaneously trying to quarrel these 565 princes who are adamant that they have nothing to do with the Indian National Congress and independence because they, through paramountcy, are directly uh, under the supervision of the monarch uh, in Britain. So to convince these people, and I think uh, Professor Harse rightly said liquidator, Actually, Mountbatten is the decolonizer, the liquidator of the British Empire. He is the man who sees and watches the sun set on the British Empire in many ways. And he comes on March 22nd because Churchill having lost, Clement Attlee having won, uh, Wavell having been replaced by uh, Mountbatten. Uh, the prince is actually quite happy that uh, Mountbatten has come because Mountbatten had been uh, aid de camp to King Edward the Seventh when he came for the Darbar in 1921-22 thought that they would actually get an extension with Mountbatten's arrival and Mountbatten was loath to doing anything but liquidating the British Empire and and is one of his first conversations I think he came on March 22nd 1947 one of his first conversations with Jawaharlal Nehru uh, Panditji asked him do you have plenty potentiary powers. And Mountbatten said yes. And Nehru realized that this man was on a mission. This man would complete the process. And although the timeline given by Mountbatten was June 30th, 1948, he actually abbreviated that and brought it to August 14 for Pakistan and August 15 for India. So imagine that in a period of six months, hardly six months, he's completed the liquidation of the British Empire. Now, in parallel, Sardar Patel in a conversation, and this is what Mountbatten did. Two days he rested after he arrived in India. And then he went into these meetings with Mahatma Gandhi, with Jawaharlal Nehru, with Jinnah, with Sardar Patel. And in one of those meetings, Patel asked him, will you give me the whole basket of apples? And Pandit and Mountbatten said, uh, you know, maybe, maybe one or two, maybe one or two will, 
will not be there. And Patel said, I want all the apples, every single one of them, referring to the 565 apples. I just want to read out a sentence or two from Nehru on Hyderabad. And I'm specifying Hyderabad because Hyderabad was the saboteur in chief. Uh, Nawab Hamidullah Khan of Bhopal was the chairman of the Chamber of Princes. Imagine in the same parliament house that we have today, there is a Narendra Mandal, a Chamber of Princes. And these princes would go there and actually <laughs> conspire against the Indian National Congress and try and stay outside the ambit of the new or emerging independent India. And if you see that concourse from parliament, there is Hyderabad House, there is Patiala, which is the courts now, there is Bikaner, there is Jamnagar. All those princes were given these huge palaces or homes. Well, hardly homes. Hyderabad House is hardly a home, it's a palace. All these princes were given homes around the concourse. Even today they stand. Patiala Court, uh, court Complex is Maharaj of Patiala. Naba, Farid Court, everybody, Bikaner. Uh, Jamnagar House is the headquarters of enforcement directorate, if you please. So, all these guys were there. I just want to read Nehru on Hyderabad. As far as for accession, it is equally clear to us that a territory like Hyderabad, surrounded on all sides by the Indian Union and with no outlet to the rest of the world, must necessarily be part of the Indian Union. Historically and culturally, it had to be a part, but geographic and economic reasons were given even more preemptory in this matter and they could not be ignored whatever the wishes of the particular individuals or groups of individuals uh, any other relationship between hyderabad and the rest of india would have involved continuing suspicion and therefore an ever-present fear of conflict so we must understand from these words that nehru's ideal and idea of india was that the 18 provinces alone cannot be india the 565 princely states along with those 18 provinces amalgamated become the idea and ideal of India. And I, I, I just want to add Sardar Patel on the same Nawab of Bhopal because it's really interesting to see how their minds uh, were working more or less in consonance. Patel actually writes to uh, Mahatma Gandhi and he is just if I can find that. Well, actually, I can't find it. But he, what he says in, in this letter to Gandhiji is that we cannot allow a rogue like the Nizam or like the Nawab of Bhopal to continue because he keeps changing his position. Uh, every single day, he comes up with a new theory, a new axiom, so that he can. Have we lost you, Sandeep? Uh, there seems to be bandwidth issue yeah. at his end. But let me let me do one thing. But before when Sandeep comes back, uh, he's talking about Hyderabad. And there's a story that Sandeep has not told about Hyderabad in his book. And I think it is worth, uh, worth hearing that. Um, I don't know where I got it. Maybe in Ram Guha's book. I don't know for sure. But um, the fact is then that the, the government decided that they are not going to allow Hyderabad to have its way. Uh, Hyderabad appealed, tried to appeal to the UN and said it was part of the Commonwealth reported and he got a Hyderabad got a support from England from the Tories government yes. people Churchill also supported uh, the Nizam so when they decided that they were not they was not going to happen and they decided to take uh, what they call police action they invited the commander in chief the night before to the cabinet meeting uh they invited him uh to uh get his opinion and so the, there was a discussion in the cabinet about taking this action 
and then Nehru turns towards uh, the commander in chief was an Englishman uh, named uh, General Butcher. General Butcher, and he so he asks him, "Well, what do you think, General Butcher?" And General Butcher says, "It's a very bad idea." take any military action at this point because the whole army is engaged in Kashmir and I can't open a second front. It will be very unprofessional and we will suffer. And uh, Nehru, after the cabinet had almost decided that this is what they're going to do, Nehru goes funk at this moment and he doesn't know where to look. But Sardar Patel, uh, I don't know whether you know, many of you are smiling, but Sadat Patel actually says at this point that, and, and you know what General Bachar says is that, look, I'm, I feel so strongly that I would resign from this job if you insist on doing this. That's what Fox Nehru. And Patel very gently said, uh, General Bachar, we appreciate your services to the Indian Army and to the new government of India. And if you feel so strongly, we will give you all the honors that you need. But the action to in Hyderabad begins at midnight tonight. The, and of course it did. And the fact is, well, I think it's a very important story because it established at one go the role of civilian leadership in India. I mean, it prevented India in some ways going the way of the generals that you had in Pakistan from General Ayub onwards. So I, I think this is an interesting story. It also has the P P P Sandeep, all the players you talked about, Patel and and uh, Nehru, I don't know whether you heard this story, but um, we, if, if you didn't, I won't repeat it because our time's short. Now, did you have any specific questions to answer, Rajan, or shall we just go to straight Ashok? Sandeep, can I you think, hear me? Uh, let, let Mr. Ban speak because he hasn't come in as yet. I think he should speak and then... Or, Maybe I could. Then you can take over, answer both. All right. Okay. Ashok? Yes, sir. Thanks, to, thanks Chair. Pakistan, what Sandeep has described it, is a political history now. The author covers major events that occurred after the independence immediately before the independence. And this has come up in 12 beautiful chapters. This inf information was very less known in the public domain. For example, the draft statement of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru on 23rd September 1923, when he said, that it was inconceivable for me that the princely states could be outside the orbit and ambit of future free India. Nor could he bear the thing of Indian princes having a separate channel of communication with the British crown. They would not be allowed to owe allegiance to any external authority or have any direct or independent relation with the crown. For that would endanger the internal security of a free India and also arrest the growth and development of the nation. So there, Sandeep has come up with a less known revelation that Pandit Nehru was aggressively involved with his own vision of free India after independence. He had sometimes agreed with Mahatma Gandhi also regarding this. Because Mahatma Gandhi, as Sandeep has projected, regarded the princes as trustees of their people 
and advocated that Indian National Congress should not intervene. And this book, according to me, is weaved in 12 chapters and has come as the most beautiful Kashmiri silk carpet meant for national and international readership. Uh, Sandeep seems to have done justice to his legacy. He has not, but we know in Kashmir and outside, his grandfather was one of the most accomplished historians who has contributed a great deal. And along with that was another Kashmiri, Darkanath Kachru, who happens to be one of my distant relations as well, because we Kashmiris are interlinked and tattoos of each other. And the trinity which he has presented, Nehru, Mountbatten and Sardar Pate, he says that they have been equal major contributed in making India as a whole. Envisioned it, Mountbatten facilitated it by breaking the bad news to the princess, and Sardar Patel shunned it aggressively after he was appointed as Minister of States in July 47. So which has started very recently, about a decade back, that it was only one person who was instrumental in integrating the states into a unit and uh, built up a cohesive and united India was only the Patel. No, Sandeep gives us the inside information that the Trinity was deadly. It was Nehru's vision and Patel's coming on the same page that they brought Mountbatten into the loop and they, by their diplomacy, by their persuasion, convinced Mountbatten, before you go out, you have to help us. And he helped. Otherwise, he owed his loyalty to the Prime Minister of England, who was, as Sandeep put it, virtually conspiring with Jinnah for balkanization of India. And besides Jinnah, as Professor Rajan said, that it's a big question also to answer, that was Jinnah a communal? Because he didn't give out this when he came to Pakistan and Pakistan's first speech when he made, he didn't give us that information that he was a commoner. But he was definitely an intriguer. He intrigued for the partition of India and he intrigued with British for further partition, second partition in the name of Princess Tan. See the irony, these facts have not come up as vividly, as clearly before the readers. And Sandeep, as I said, that he has done great justice to his legacy of the illustrious forefathers, of his grandfather, vision of history, because he was a first-hand participant along with Pandit Pandit Nehru, two of the Kashmiris were helping Pandit Nehru in accomplishing the idea of uniting India and blunting the concept of Prince Istan for further balkanization of India. So, a book which I say that it has been done after a great effort of research and was lucky 
than other authors who have written on the political history of India post partition. He was lucky to have inherited the first hand knowledge through his father and some of the documents which were left behind by his father that uh, is not with every author therefore this book becomes the voice of a reader as the first book with new facts these facts have not been brought out as yet because nobody could take such pains as Sandeep has. And Sandeep is saying that I, I was never in politics. I was an economist. And from economic politics, I won't say this is a graduation. This is a mastery. And uh, he has done it in such a way, as I said, as a master craftsman. He has weaved it into the beautiful Silk on silk. Thank you. Thank you. Ashok. Stop it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, can we? Can we now? I mean, in the interest of time, I'm, I, I have to uh, stop you there. Uh, I'd like now Sandeep to go into some of the themes that have been raised. Uh, some of the themes that have been raised, particularly, go into the role. You know, India has never been a country of, of empires. It's been a country of kingdoms. And the uh, Nizams was a kingdom uh, that we talked about. Kashmir was a kingdom. And so, how? what does it mean for us today? Um, India is not, uh, I mean, that, that kind of centralized control that was envisaged uh, is not the temper of our country. Uh, our temp uh, the democratic temper of the country, that we are a very diverse country of many, many nations almost. And so just uh, take some of these themes that have been raised uh, so far and let's hear your views. And then let's get to the audience. Uh but first, I'd like to thank uh, Bansa for his very kind words. Uh, and he's right. I uh, studied economics. I never studied history. But uh, as I immersed myself deeper and deeper into these papers, I realized that uh, history is, is, is something completely novel and completely different. And this immersive experience has partly led me to uh, do what uh, what I've managed to do. Uh, it, it, it was a painstaking uh, job and effort because even if you have the necessary papers of a particular age, you still have to fact check, you still have to corroborate. And that is what I did at the National Archives at uh, Nehru Memorial. Uh, but as I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a protracted process and it took me all of almost four years to put this book together. Uh, now to come to some of the questions that have been raised, uh, please understand that, you know, we keep saying Sardar Saab, Sardar Saab. Uh, 1923, as uh, Mr. Ban rightly pointed out, Panditji gives this impassioned speech, which is completely anti-monarchy, anti-royalty, anti-princes. And, and it tells you this is after returning from Britain, it tells you that this man is besotted with the idea of tearing down the monarchy as it exists in this country, uh, or as it existed then. Realizing that he was not getting uh, too much leeway on this issue with Mahatma Gandhi, again, as Mr. Ban rightly pointed out, and as I've done so in the book, because Mahatma Gandhi believed in the concept of trusteeship, that the, that the princelings or the nawabs or the maharajas or the rajas were trustees of the people. Uh, Pandit Nehru was dogged in his approach. He, he refused to, you know, he, he was like this, he had this bit between his teeth and he just refused to let go. 
on this issue, on this specific issue. We have to understand Mahatma Gandhi's father was the Diwan of Rajkot. So, uh, Koba Gandhi uh, and, and Mahatma Gandhi himself, whenever he revisited Rajkot, was given the pride of place by the Diwan of Rajkot, the Thakur, as uh, the Raja was ca called. And he allowed uh, Mahatma Gandhi to sit on his throne and he himself sat at Mahatma Gandhi's feet whenever Gandhiji visited Rajkot. But it is Rajkot, the experience of Rajkot, which, who, who uh, the, the, the Thakur himself and his uh, uh, prime minister, as it were, uh, Darbar Virawala, between the two, they ran circles around Mahatma Gandhi. And Mahatma Gandhi finally was vanquished and he returned and he wrote in the Harijan that I have been defeated by these two people in Rajkot. But keeping that aside, what Jawaharlal Nehru did is he created something called, he created a new entity. He created, realizing that the Indian National Congress could not make deep inroads into these 560, five princely states where the process of democratization needed to take place, he created a parallel stalking horse called the All India States People's Conference. AISPC, where he appointed Sheikh Abdullah as the vice president, where his own uh, man Dwarkanath Kachu played a key role, and he used this AISPC to go deeper and deeper into these princely states to create the concept of democracy. And and we saw, we've seen in Mysore, we saw in Katiawad, and we saw in many other places how the AIS, AISPC became a forerunner of the, Cong the Indian National Congress. And between the two, they actually were like a battering ram and they entered these princely states and began the process of democrat democratization. To bring all these people on board on to the constituent assembly, that by itself was another challenge because without them coming on board, without them joining the constituent assembly, it would be virtually impossible to create this new India, which included the provinces and the... And the uh, princely states. So, so it is a very important bit <coughs> that I'm going to mention here. Uh, it is in the Chamber of Princes that we first saw a communal cleave where Maharaja Sadul Singh of Bikaner wrote a masterly uh, aid memoir, secret aid memoir. A copy of the original aid memoir is with me, thanks to my grandfather. This aid memoir was then circulated within the Chamber of Princes and this convinced and he was he was backed by the Maharaja of Patiala at this time and this created a communal cleave where uh, you had uh, the Nawab of Bhopal, Hamidullah Khan, the Nizam and some of the others on one side, Travancore, Kashmir always vacillating also on the same side, Junagar also on the same side and Sadul Singh, Maharaja Sadul Singh wrote this really strong aid memoir convincing the Indian Hindu princes that there was no alternative but to join the India as it was emerging, to join the Constituent Assembly and to support uh, Nehru, Patel uh, and the Congress Party in their endeavor to become an independent India. These are, these are very, very important parts uh, and, I, and I find that they have not been dealt with adequately or some of this has not even emerged anywhere and this this comes as a personal shock to me and that's why perhaps it took me longer than you know it took me four years to write this book because as a as a trained economist and who studied e economics to move into a brand new branch uh, was was uh, of course a novel experience and uh, what it has done to me personally now is that whenever i see any uh, strand of history the first thing that I do is start looking and, and you know, finding facts and things about it. So my entire outlook by writing this book has changed completely. And, and uh, I think this vile revision of Jawaharlal Nehru uh, was, was one of the most important reasons for me to do this book. Because I, I thought that the legacy, the heritage... Uh, not just of my own grandfather of Dwarkanath Kachru, who played a crucial role. Unfortunately, he died in an air crash in 1950. He would have been, he would have been somebody very important uh, in in India. You know the way we, uh, or oh, for that matter, V P Menon. I don't think V P Menon has got the adequate rec recognition uh, in Indian history, barring the fact that he wrote the integration of India. 
there, there is no recognition of this man. This man drove, traveled by train, tra went all over India from Orissa to Kathiawad, from Rajasthan to the south and went and spoke to these princes, convinced them, coerced them as, as both Professor and uh, Mr. Ban have said, used persuasion, coercion, <laughs> browbeated, used browbeating tactics and slowly and steadily he is the man actually and he has not got enough credit mind you so uh, to give there is no doubt that sardar patel played a crucial role but to say that sardar patel was the only person responsible is is a is not the truth okay so sandeep let's now i think uh, usha has come in and we need to be mindful of the time uh, in my watch, it says 4.51, which gives us nine minutes, unfortunately, to deal with the questions from the floor. So, Usha ji, would you, would you give us the questions? Would you, would you read them out? Or would you like me to do that? I think if you could do that, that would save me. I'm not very good with technology. I might lose you in the process. Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Please. Yeah, unmute, unmute yourself. Yeah, right. Uh, so there is a question from Bikash Narayan Mishra from Delhi. And he says that the proposed Central Vista, which is going to be a reality now, withstanding the criticisms on account of pandemic and economic compulsion, is an attempt to dilute the colonial Nehruvian legacy. Uh, this question is for Sandeepji. Uh, it's a good question because uh, only uh, there's been huge there's been a huge controversy. The matter is in the courts. Uh, Mr. Ban would know that both the High Court and the Supreme Court are uh, uh, seized of this matter. But I think Hardeep Puri, the Minister of Urban Development, has given uh, his views today on the issue, and I would think that uh, he is he's telling us uh, what we all wanted to hear, which is that none of the existing uh, things would be pulled down along the central vista. I think this is the best. If this is what he said, because I read this from, from my own team uh, as we put it out on the news wire, because the greatest fear is that the concourse and the central vista, as we know it, and as we discussed it briefly, uh, would be torn down and these new buildings would come up. So I think Hardeep Puri, maybe because of the huge controversy that this matter has uh, taken shape, uh, has said that none of these That's old structures will be thing, Sandeep. But I would say, uh, let's go to questions that relate to your book. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I would think so. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There is a question from Prasenjit the Biswas from Shri Long. And it says, 1948 Hyderabad massacre left a huge trail of bloodshed. Was there an attempt to provide some transitional justice to uh, prisoners of war? those arrested and maimed and their families, that these defeated still uh, live in some camps, can there be a repartition? Who is this meant for? Sandeep, for you. Anyone, 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 anyone. Well, anyone. So, Professor, if you would want to answer this one. <laughs> uh, I have not really studied Hyderabad, but this was a decision that action did take place and there was some kind of you know, violence which was not was untold but what, what happened to refugees or what, how they are to be accommodated i have no answer i have not gone through any primary source how i'll take yeah. just one uh, just one uh, second state. Yeah. i wanted to inter sorry to interrupt you the total toll of the hyderabad action was six soul six Indian soldiers of the Indian state died, and on the other side, about 2,000 Razakars right. died. That's the thing. I'm not, not sure that's uh, what the questioner was was asking, but I think it's the question of rehabilitation or something. I mean, I'm not sure any of us know. Okay. I don't know um, anybody has the answer. Usha ji, can I go to, sorry, we. Can we yeah. go to the next question? We don't yes, have uh, 
uh, it says DC Patak from Gurugram he says was the basis of partition that accompanied independence a factor that influenced the thinking of at least some princes. Anybody could uh, answer? So, so let's let's understand this this process of uh, decolonization. All the princes were offered standstill agreements by uh, the rulers. Uh, of course, uh, some of the princes themselves thought uh, that they had a direct connection with uh, uh, the British Empire through treaties and, of course, the concept of paramountcy. Uh, but in reality, all of them had to sign an instrument of accession for either of the two dominions in, in this in this case. One was Pakistan and the other was India. And it is only a few princes who stalled. Otherwise, the majority, overwhelming majority of them signed the instrument of accession for, for India. It is only Kashmir which vacillated and then signed it subsequently on October 26, 1947. In the case of Hyderabad, there was Operation Polo, which is Indian police action whereby we surrounded the state of Hyderabad and then in a in a police action we took over Hyderabad. Junagar actually saw a referendum where 90 almost 98 percent 99 percent of the population of Junagar voted in favor of India and that left Travancore which conspired till the very end using uh, uh, its thorium uh, to negotiate with the British, but that too failed. Uh, C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer's plan failed. So uh, it, it was very clear that every single princely state had the option. Now for Patel, for Nehru and for Mountbatten, particularly for the first two, it was imperative that you cannot see the partition of India actually is not the partition of India. Let's understand that because the partition of India is the partition of the state of Punjab and the state of Bengal. The rest of the rest of the Union of India, as we know it, remained. So this this would have created another Pakistan in the middle of India, which would be Hyderabad. So you would have had East Pakistan, South Pakistan, and then of course Pakistan and Kashmir, as we know, even today, uh, despite the controversial accession, remains a festering sore. So. This, this was completely unacceptable to the founding fathers of this country and particularly for Pandit, Nehru Pandit, and Pandit, can the, I ask you? Sorry, sorry, uh, Sandeep, I think we're running out of time. But the quick question was that Indira Gandhi abrogated in 71 or something. She abrogated yeah. that instrument of accession. And, and I, I mean, some of us felt very bad that, you know, how much money was there, it was, it was peanuts. And to have given up, uh, I mean, these were, this was a legal, legal treaties we made, this instrument of session. Yeah. And to abrogate that was not, not right. Do you agree with that? Well, what Indira Gandhi did was wrong. I, I think, I think you should, you should view this from the prism of Indira Gandhi because she was a hardcore socialist. And, and this was an age, if you remember, between 69 and 73, she nationalized everything. Insurance, petroleum, banks, gold mines, privy purses. So, it's, I don't think it was purely uh, that the princes were being targeted. It is, I think, a larger action against all, all these, all these sort India. of feudal <laughs> and, and if you remember, if you remember... Uh, some of these princes actually became a part of the Swatantrata Party and they opposed Indira Gandhi yeah. and they fought, I think, the 1967 election against her. So, Sandeep, I think we have run out of time. Am I right? No, Ushaji? we can, you know, we can have it, you know, have another 10, 10 to 12 minutes here. Yeah. We can oh, go beyond oh, this. Oh, gosh. Wow. Yeah. Okay. This one so, um, more question. Uh, if you would like to, uh, it's from Air Marshal Naresh Verma. Uh, he says, Mr. Bamzer was talking about Nawab of Bhopal when there was a break in connectivity. I request you to complete the anecdote. Uh, okay, so uh, Jinnah was, uh, Jinnah being Jinnah was, uh, was a master uh, at deceit. Uh, imagine a man uh, creating a nation 
uh, a theocratic nation out of nothing. He was a congressman who realized that religion uh, would be uh, the way forward and created a theocratic state out of nothing, uh, virtually nothing. Uh, Jinnah promised the Nawab of Bhopal governor generalship of Pakistan. Just as Nehru asked Mountbatten to continue after independence as the governor general of Pakistan, of India. So uh, Bhopal was always, you know, like this bee flitting from one place to the other, thinking that if he could bring these princes on board, that if he could help Jinnah and Vaival, and uh, of course, we, we are forgetting one very important character who outlasted Churchill and Vaival. His name was Sir Conrad Corfield, and he was the boss of the British political department. Now, uh, let's understand what the political department did. Every single princely state, big ones, had a resident. The resident reported directly into this Conrad Corfield fellow, and this Conrad Corfield was the master like Jinnah of deceit, of conspiracy, of, uh, you know, palace putches and uh, machinations, etc. And Nehru was terribly opposed to this Conrad Corfield, as was Mountbatten, but that's a separate story. So Jinnah was always in league with the Nawab of Bhopal, with, and Bhopal then used Travancore, used Kashmir, and uh, there was the Nizam backing uh, the Nawab yeah. of Bhopal. That's why they they did they could do whatever they they succeeded in doing. But when on July 15, Mountbatten admonished all these princes and told them that there is nothing for paramountcy. You have to choose one of the two dominions. Uh, Mr. Hamidullah Khan or Nawab Hamidullah Khan actually broke down and revealed to his uh, uh, to, to his closest aides that. Mountbatten had betrayed uh, all the princes because they believed that Mountbatten, since he was ADC to Prince Edward and had come to India earlier, he would actually galvanize the concept of the princes breaking free from the Union of India, allowing the balkanization. Yeah, and it's very curious that actually the Tory party, the, the Conservative party, sided a lot of them sided with the princess, including Churchill, you know, yes. on issues of Bhopal and, 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 and particularly the Nizam in Hyderabad. Okay, any other questions, uh, Ushaji? Uh, no, that's fine. There are comments, more of comments, actually. One or two oh, points I want to add. One or two points Third, I can add. Go ahead. Uh, one thing is, sure. is I do South Pakistan was booming in the interwar period. And there are certain professors in Usmania University that are thinking of building South Pakistan in Hyderabad. There are also feelers to England. So that England intervenes and also gives support to Nizam to fight it if it comes to that. So we are right in saying that. Another thing I felt about the book was that many times we singularly kind of point out Patel did this, Patel did this. And you can see from Sandeep's book how it was a collective effort of so many people together. And that yeah. brought integration. And certain interesting things like about how Corfield was very cunning, how Thakur was very cunning, that comes out very live in the way he has described the, in his narratives. And they are very attractive. And on the whole, kind of, it's a very well-researched book, unique book, because nobody threw light on this particular aspect. It was collective. Pandit Nehru also was involved in this, and it is not one man's effort. That everything was done collectively, multilaterally, and that comes out very properly in the book. That's why author has succeeded in driving home the point. Bhan Sab also made similar points actually before. Yeah, the, the, I yeah. think the, the significant point that Sandeep made earlier, and it's evident in the book is that for me, you know, I have a managerial background. And one of the things we learn as managers is that implementation is everything. And the guy who doesn't get enough credit in all this is the chief implementer, which is VP Menon. We know... I think Mr. Das has unmuted his mic. 
there seems to be a power outage or something so yeah that may uh, it's another lesson for all of us that implementation is as important if not more important than strategy anyone can have a strategy but very few can implement it true i so, i just want um, to add one last thing mr das that uh, all the uh, participants have pointed out that this was a collective i would uh, liken it to a, bait, a relay race where the baton was passed from pandit ji to to mountbatten to sardar patel and then to vp menon and then of course all these invisible faceless people who worked so hard to bring about the independence of this country yes. i don't think i don't think enough has been right. written or done uh, for all those freedom fighters who in different parts of this country uh, un- in in their own small or big way contributed to the independence of yeah. this of this nation i i think that yeah. this you know, this particular are, aspect of freedom is not is not uh, adequately uh, we we've, we've not done enough work on this on the freedom movement of this country i think we, this needs to but, be but you know it. sandeep what is significant in what you say is that the the it's we are we are critical of our government we are critical of our bureaucracy today but here is an instance where the chain of command of power going to the lowest officer was so crucial that it was in the trenches that the battles were fought and the prize was huge imagine if we had been 500 countries instead yeah. of <laughs> just to <laughs> instead of one or two yeah. and and we True. just do not appreciate the job involved here which it was like a miracle i think absolutely and and absolutely. and truly and, and, and we were at, basic there was partition and in parallel we were fighting a war in kashmir because as war soon as can... the instrument of accession was signed the raiders had already descended into the valley of kashmir and the war had more or less begun so all this was happening at the yeah. same time but also the violence of the partition was also happening i mean yes. that was here was a case where there was no violence i mean in the barring, sense, i mean barring for what happened the- in hyderabad and barring what happened in kashmir yes it is all right. seamless it is all violence yes. free and every single imagine all the from kathiawad uh, nizam orissa yeah. bengal northeast all no, this has come to without any bloodshed i mean if you imagine the the how people would have had to move from place to place if these states had been yes left yes. the way they were anyway i think we have had a good session rajan and ashok if you want to add anything uh to this otherwise i think it's time to say goodbye uh to to our audience and to you sandeep for having delivered a a a, a very 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 nice book which has made us very really nice. nice made us thank, really you so thank you so much a very thank you part of us thank you so much professor no. thank you so thank much you, thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. bye bye okay bye bye everybody